Oh, do you have to, um, is it on? Okay, perfect. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce you, we're, we're quite lucky today here, to have uh, Tommy Alice, is that pronounced correctly? Yeah. Uh, who's the CEO of Podio. Now, I know most of you have been using Podio for your group, so feel free to ask him some questions on ironing out some bugs or how fantastic his software and his I'm network CEO, is. so I don't do bugs, so <laughs> don't ask me about that. Um, so I'll, I'll pass it over to you Thanks. Uh, now. Cool. Hey, thanks for seeing me today. Um, I'm actually here to tell you whatever you want to hear. So I hope that I can limit my part of talking of presentation to five or ten minutes and then do Q&A for the remaining uh, 35 minutes rather than the other way around. Uh, I'm not that good uh, of, a, I'm not that much of a short talker. So it might not, uh, I might not succeed in that. So just interrupt me uh, during my first 10 minutes that might extend to 30 minutes. My, my goal of being here today, um, I hope, I assume you have a goal of being here today, but, but my goal is actually that I can help you understand how it is to do a startup so all of you could, after this session or after this course, say that within the first 10 years of your career, you'll either be working for a startup or you'll be doing a startup on your own because it's so much more fun than working for other people. It's so much more uh, um, rewarding to be part of creating something from scratch that is not just something, a Novo or Danske Bank or IBM, McKinsey or whatever organization. So I really hope that's my, uh, that's my aim of being here today. So any question you have in that regard, how it is to do a startup, how do we get started, please shoot. It doesn't have to be limited to what Podio is and box around, uh, around Podio. So but let me just start off asking, how many of you actually do believe that within the first 10 years of your career, it might not be the first job, but within the first 10 years, you'll either be starting a company on your own or with some, uh, some colleagues, or you'll be working for a startup defined as a company within the first couple of years. How many? Pretty good. Wow. Then I'm done. <laughs> so uh, I, can, I can see there's still a few that didn't, uh, didn't answer yes in that, so, so, so I'll, I'll go on. But I think it is damn important that, that there are a, is a big part of, of, uh, of Danes that want, or Danes or foreigners, but at least in Denmark, or in Europe that want to start their own company because it's the, it's the only th way we're going to create the wealth we should live off in the future. And, and, and actually a lot of big companies don't even realize that. A lot of big companies believe that because they're big they have, and have always been there, they'll always be there. But that's not true. They will be overtaken by a company that you will, uh, will create, most likely. Most companies that we have today were not here 100 years ago, right? So 100 years from now. Many of them will not be here and new companies you start will be the big ones that we all talk about. So go out and create those companies. So just a big background, a uh, short background on me first. Um, I'm a lawyer of uh, education. I regret that I didn't study anything here because it would definitely, I, I, I see law as studying business and uh, it would, it's much easier to teach someone that can actually do some real work, code, science, something about business that it is to teach something that someone that only understands business or law for that matter, how to do this, the hard stuff that you're learning at, at, at this place. So really envy you for, for being here. If my kids come and ask me one day, I don't think they will, but if they ask me for advice, I'll say go to DTU or go to study medicine or something like that. But I was lucky enough to, to get into McKinsey and spend, uh, spend four years uh, in there. Uh, great place to start your career, could definitely recommend that. Uh, not, not, not in particular McKinsey, but just consultancy because you get to see a lot of things and you actually get to learn a lot of things if you get into one of the, uh, of, of the good places. Um, I then, uh, straight out of McKinsey, couldn't really see me uh, going, all, uh, you know, going for the partner track in there, so I started my, my first company. It was a uh, stupid, lame, very, very limited idea around online SMS. This was 2005. You can only send an SMS from, from, your, from your cell phone. You couldn't send it from, from your laptop. We want, to start it. we want to start that. We started the company three, four guys uh, employed, and then after nine months we realized this is not going anywhere, so we liquidated the company and stopped that. So that was the failure. And when you do startup, you need to be able to, to do the failures as well. Uh, not a prerequisite, but it's a good learning curve. So this was my first part of my learning curve in the startup world. I then went on and did uh, a company called SUP, which was doing, uh, a company that did uh, social networking or, and backup of your contact list on your mobile. Anyone here remember SUP? Yeah, anyone use it? Only 50%. So awareness, 
<laughs> and used 50%. Um, so, so Soup was basically, uh, this was 2005, so pre-iPhone, pre-Facebook, a weird world to think about today. And uh, you, know, you had your contact list was stuck on your phone. So we thought, let's get it out of the phone. And once we have it out, we can definitely offer the utility of backing up your contact information. And then on top of that, we could build a social network because on and when Facebook then came out, the way we did our pitch was to say, you know, you, you, on Facebook, you only have some, you know, a few friends. You don't have your entire social network. Your mom and your aunt is not on Facebook. <laughs> Not true anymore, true back then. So, so our, our plan was to build a social network uh, based on your, your contact list. It, great team, 25 people working out of an office in Cambridge and an office in, on Nurbo. And uh, we got then uh, in 2008, we got sold uh, to, uh, to Vodafone, uh, one of the world's biggest uh, mobile companies, for close to 250 million uh, Danes without any revenue. So a great team, a great product, and something they needed for their billion dollar strategy around going from not only being a dumb bit pipe and also be a service provider. Strategy failed miserably. We'll get back to that. Uh, no, we'll not get back to that in this session. <laughs> That's another session about how big companies don't do it the right way. I then had the, the fortune of staying inside the big company for, for two years, working my, uh, my, my time. Uh, when you sell a company, you get a, a, a logout. Basically, you, you, you have to to, you know, they, they buy a company at, when they buy a company at that stage, you, you have to, to uh, they also buy the team, so they do what they can to retain the team. And my retention was so interesting, so I stayed there for two years, even though it wasn't that interesting to be there. But, you know, worked my, my time there, I was CEO for, for another company that acquired in Sweden, and saw that, you know, there's a lot of things that a big company is good at doing, but definitely not innovation. So I couldn't stand it, so the day after my logout ran out, I quit. I invested in uh, Podia and joined Podia as the fourth employee. Back then, it was three guys in the basement that started the company one and a half, half year earlier. And I then uh, invested uh, two and a half million Danish into the company and joined as uh, CEO. And that's what I'm doing right now. So that's what I'm going to be talking about for the next uh, 10 minutes. So Podia. Um, you said, Thomas, that a lot of you are actually using Podia. Is that, does everyone here know what Podia is? Anyone does not, that doesn't know what Podia is? A few, okay. Podia is an online work platform that is, uh, it's a social work platform that try to, to kill emails in the workplace. And the way we're doing that is we allow people to build their own small apps, not real apps, not real code. It's small templates where around those templates they can structure their, uh, structure their work. That's basically what Podia is about. So Podia is, is, is an attempt to go out to, to all the workplaces and say, the way you work today is broken, this is the new way of working. If we just take a quick look at the history of, of Podium. So in, uh, the company was started in 2009 by two founders, uh, John and, uh, John and, and Anas. And uh, after, <clears throat> after nine months, they uh, got the first beta customers in that actually started paying for the product uh, back then already. On a very, very early prototype of the product, was still good enough to actually convince some companies to pay. That paid the bills. And they also got a, a third co-founder on board, Casper Hultin. Then in May 2010, I start having, um, uh, uh, having some, um, some, some discussion with the team. And we realized it was a quite a good fit for me to come in as CEO and also as an investor. So it happened there. And with my money, we then had, a, had an opportunity to, to expand the team and grew the team throughout 2010. Then in September 2010, we came out of stealth mode. There's a lot of weird uh, language around startups. Stealth mode is that you, no one really knows what you're doing. It's so secret. You only invite customers in. You cannot find it online. That's what we have been doing until September 2010. September 2010, we went out there and said, this is Podio. It's great. But you still need to ask for an invitation. So we still call it beta. It wasn't kind of launched yet. Another way of phrasing it to say, you know, we have not launched yet. So numbers are pretty impressive. We haven't even launched yet. But yet we would love all the customers we could get. In December 2010, we got $4 million in from uh, in a Series A uh, financing um, uh, round from, yeah, forget the Series A part here, but just we got $4 million in from uh, Sunstone Capital uh, investor. We had uh, quite intense discussion with both investors here in Scandinavia, in, in, in London, Berlin, and in, in, in US, mainly on the West Coast. And given the stage we were in uh, as a company, we thought it was... Uh, uh, best to have an investor that was pretty close to us. And that has actually worked out uh, pretty well. Uh, in, uh, and then in March 2011, we launched to the public. So we went out and said, now we open for business to everyone. And we did that in a, in a store, in uh, a physical store in, in San Francisco. And then the month after, we opened our US office in San Francisco. And then 
things have been going pretty well ever since. Uh, won TechCrunch uh, Europe, a prize for best business startup, and uh, have more than 40,000 organizations in 170 countries using, uh, using Podio. This is the store in, uh, in, uh, in San Francisco. So basically took an uh, old store, rented it for two months, and then did it, uh, you know, spent amazingly little money, $5,000, on making it look like almost an Apple store in terms of how, how simplistic the design was and how, how appealing it was, and actually also how, 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 how big it was. And then we, for a week long, we run, uh, ran all kind of uh, events in there. And on, uh, on uh, launch night, I don't know whether you can see that, but this is inside the store. We had you know, a room packed, uh, 500 people, and a line outside. Brilliant pictures of that line outside, of people waiting to get in because the, the bouncers, the door wouldn't let more people in for fire uh, you know, regulation uh, reasons. Uh, this is the team, and uh, this is the office here in Copenhagen, a team. We are uh, 25 uh, people uh, roughly in the team now, 27 actually, uh, 20 people in Copenhagen and 7 people in, uh, in San Francisco. One thing, just a comment overall, when, when you go out and, 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 and do your, your company, when you start that, what you see here is a team uh, two, three years after it started. But when it all starts out, actually when you go back and look at the history here, you see John, Anas, and Casper. And if you take one, there was actually one guy employed, we call him founding developer, and he, he, he's then the, the code or the technical engine behind this, a guy called Andreas. If you take those four, you have the three Ds that you need when you look at the team to start a company. You have the distributor, so the sales guy, the guy that can communicate to the marketing, the, the, uh, the, the, the marketeer. You have the developer, so the guy, when we talk this type of companies, so the guy that can actually code the stuff you, you dream about uh, doing. And you have the designer, and this is not only a UX designer, or graphical designer, but a designer that can actually understand the users so he can design the concepts. So those are the three guys you need in the team, and those should be the three founders of teams. When I look at investing companies, I often look at, do you have that threesome of those, those three individuals that actually supplement each other in that way? If I need meet uh, three engineers uh, that all can code extremely well, I might have some reservations. Not always. Depends on the exact, the, uh, the exact team dynamic. If you have three guys out of uh, CBS, none of them can go, definitely have reservations. <laughs> Back to the comment I made earlier on that you, can you guys can, uh, can learn business, but these guys cannot learn to, you know, the more technical advanced things in, in, in life. So, so I think it's a very important point when you look at starting a company, how you, you know, who are your co-founders? And you might not find them at this place. You might go at, at a, uh, you know, business date at uh, CBS or Copenhagen University and then find your, your, your co-founders there. So just a bit of a sidetrack here. So let's just talk a bit about what, what Podio actually is. So work today is broken. And I might be talking to some people that don't, haven't really realized how broken work is because, you know, you are, I guess most of you are under 25 even? How many are old, uh, young, older than 25? Okay, older than 30? Sorry. <laughs> you know, you haven't, and, I, and I, I'm barely there, right? I started working at, uh, the, the first big company I worked at, and the only place I've really been using email to an extreme degree was probably uh, Q8, the oil company, where I worked at night shifts, uh, just over here in Sonfri, um, where I, on, on the head office, trying to help people with the heat system at the middle of the night. There we used email. This was 96 when I started law. And McKinsey used email a lot, but today, out in the workplace, in the modern workplaces, email is already getting killed. But let's just pretend that you are 40 years old and you work at Novo Nordisk or you work at Denske Bank. Not, uh, you know, modern workplaces in that regard in terms of how they use tools. They use email as a collaboration tool. Email is really, electro you know, it's letters that you just made electronic instead, right? They're not made to, to collaborate around a thing. They're made to send one thing to another person, that person receives it, and then he does something out of that email. But today, it's, it's turned into a collaboration platform. And at the same time, you're then putting things into document. And documents, again, is not made to the way we work today in an online world. Document was made for printing and putting binders. So those two things combined where you send out you know, Excel sheet, imagine that you have a project plan, something that you need people to collaborate around. You want to hire five people for your team in, in London. It starts out in an Excel sheet where they put a list of uh, people they want to hire or an item list of things they need to do. 
and then they attach that to an email and CC 10 people on that, and then we have kicked off the project and we work on that. Then they forgot to CC some other people, they get another guy into the team, they cannot get them involved. Things live inside the Excel sheet. In the Excel sheet, they do a column called comments. That's the social, how social it gets, right? So if people then go in, open that Excel sheet, write the comment in there, save it, and then email around to everyone and say they made some comments. Yes, Google Spreadsheet solves some of it, but not all of it. Work is broken, so there's someone needs to fix it. There are quite a few companies out there that are trying to fix it. A lot of these are called, you know, is, is part of what we call social business. So that is another way of working with, it's not inside email. That's actually using, instead of, you know, working with the hierarchy in, 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 in cubicles, you go out and work in an activity stream. So um, an activity stream, you all know from, from both Twitter and, and, and Facebook, that is also getting into the workplace now with tools like Yammer, Box, uh, Huddle, and of course, uh, Podio. So that social way of working definitely solves some part of the issue here because you make things much more transparent. Uh, people, when they come to work, you guys, when you go out and get your first job, I'm hearing this from HR directors in big companies, they have people like you, knowledge worker, come and start working for them, and then they leave after a few months and say, how do you expect me to work with these kind of tools you give me? I cannot just go out and look for information inside the company. I cannot just approach people. I have to know their email addresses. I have to you know, have a code to, to this information in order to unlock it and all of that. Um, whereas they come from, from a world of uh, the, the, the consumer world where you know, they can post anything on Facebook, on Twitter, on, on blogs. They can search information. They can connect to anyone on, on LinkedIn and again on, 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 on Facebook. And then they come into the workplace where they should turn this, all these abilities you have as individuals where it's transparent, everything is accessible, no hierarchies. You then come into the workplace and the workplace should then reap the benefits of, of that education that is completely shifting the way we think about things. And then they cannot, you cannot reap that, those benefits. And that's a bit when, when, when the workplace looked like this on the left-hand side. So a lot has happened in terms of turning it to the right-hand side where things are more transparent and uh, information is flo floating freely inside, inside the workplace. But the issue is, and that is now getting to the core of, so Podio is doing all of that as well. We, we are creating a, you know, some people call Podio Facebook for, uh, for work or Facebook for businesses. And that is, it's, a, it's tacky, but it helps to kind of frame what, what we're doing. Um, so so um, we are that, but we are a bit more than that. Because some of the issues we see with taking social into the workplace is that things are kind of separated in this way, where social is what you have on the, on, on the uh, right-hand side here, but the work actually mostly happens in systems that look, look like this on the left-hand side. So inside these system of records, your sales ledger, your recruiting system, your project management tool, all of this that's, that companies just, you know, just 100 people, they start having tools like that often developed specifically for, for, for the work they're doing or off the shelf, but very, very rigid in, in, in the structure. No social, no interaction, and very, very boring to, to live in. So then you start doing social things in the workplace. And those social things are then dependent on that you remember to do things in the system of record, and then you go to the social part and write about it. So it becomes a bit of double bookkeeping, that I have to do something in this system, and then I have to go out, out, over there and say, just did this. And that, that's kind of it breaks down quickly. We've seen that with some Yammer implementation, not to pick on them, but they're, they're quite well known and we get some of their customers uh, over to us and they feel that, you know, it starts up being great, you know, we are social, we have internal Twitter for everyone in the company and then people are not keeping up with it because it's, it's a bit broken like that. So what we believe is that we, we believe that you have to bring those more, uh, closer together. So you need to have that business part inside that social. So the way we have done that on Podio is we allow people to work in these defined work, uh, workspaces where they can have an HR process, a finance process, a sales process, and then inside, uh, inside these workspaces they can then build their own s small apps so they can actually get to work like they want to do and not like some you know, system thought uh, of or, or built in Redmond or tells them to do. And, you know, and we believe that creates that connected work where your social uh, work stream, the new way of working, is then connected to the work you actually do. So the way we normally phrase it is that in Podio you, you're not only talking about work, but you actually are doing the work. And the way you know, we see this, uh, how many actually knows Facebook, I know, but uh, how many knows about Lotus Notes? Pretty impressive. Why? It's almost death. <laughs> How, how come you know about Lotus Notes? Have you been using it in, in, a, in a workplace? We used to work in bank and we use Lotus Notes for communication. Okay, yeah, there you go. So Lotus Notes is actually, Lotus Notes were actually one of the first 
that back in the 90s started to go out and say, what if people could build their own work tools? What if they, a bit that you can do with the Excel sheet, where you also feel that you can model things yourself, you can put the colors on, you can put the, the, the graphs in the new one. People should feel the same with their work tools, the way they communicate, the way they do an expense reporting form or an HR pro, uh, recruiting process. So Lotus Note were the first to do that. It's, it's done in the 90s and you can still see that, right? So we don't feel they're all the way there, but if you took the ideas out of Lotus Note and combined with the ideas of Facebook, we think you have something very powerful and that's basically what, what, what Podio is about. So in Podio, people build apps for all kind of things and actually think that number of 45,000 um, apps that have been built is closer to a couple of hundred thousands, uh, a thousand apps been built and modified by users. And they're all kind of things, a few, few very, very simple examples you see there. More 600 of those are available in the App Store. And what we can see is that when people, we can see the difference between people just taking some things from the App Store and not doing anything about it, and then the people that actually do go and, and, and build them themselves and modify them, uh, the engagement is, is, is significantly higher on that. So when you, when you do this for users, you really get these users that feel super, like super users. They, they feel really empowered. And that you can actually see with a work tool that is doing something as boring as financial reporting. You can actually get tweets like these uh, from, from people. So people go out to, to, you know, to the public on Twitter and talk about what, uh, what, how amazing Podio is. And that's actually something when you, talk about, when you talk about consumer tools, when you talk about Foursquare, when you talk about YouTube. No surprise here, but when you talk about things for the workplace, quite surprising that we can get this level and we get this we probably get uh, uh, tweets like this uh, two, three, four times a day uh, right now. So this is Podio. You've seen it, so I'll not go into a demo. I'll stop here by just showing you a uh, short video um, of a user using, uh, using Podio and let him tell how he why he finds uh, Podio so, uh, so compelling. Uh, the guy you'll be listening to here is the uh, head of or VP of corporate development at Twitter. So he's the guy at Twitter that uh, buys uh, companies. Um, so sits in the M&A uh, department. And before, I'll, I'll let him uh, talk. I'll not try to, to kind of fill out the... Sound? Just waiting for some sound. Another example of broken systems. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a corporate development Twitter, so my responsibility is primarily mergers and acquisitions. Uh, because an acquisition requires work across Twitter, it requires input and evaluation from finance, legal, HR, engineering, product, um, security, for example. Um, our management team. It really requires uh, participation, evaluation, and contribution from all these different uh, functions inside of Twitter. Uh, we use Podio to orchestrate all of those interactions. I wanted to kind of systematize our process of sourcing companies, reviewing companies, figuring out if we're going to pursue them for acquisition. But I'm an impatient guy, and I didn't want to wait months to work with some engineering consultant to go through some major process. Uh, my friend knew of Podio, and what was unique about Podio is my friend described it, and sure enough, uh, though I was skeptical that I would be able to build this uh, deal log, which is what we call it, uh, I was able to do it in, in five or 10 minutes. Uh, what I did was I said, okay, I know what the fields are that are important to me. I want to track the company name. I may want to uh, put in a numerical field to say how much uh, invested capital the company has raised. I want some priority so that I can track kind of a funnel, say it's low priority, medium priority. And there were probably 10 other fields that I wanted. Um, and I was able just to drop and drag uh, those fields from Podio, literally just you know, across the screen with a mouse click, and then I could see what the app would look like, hit save, and then there it was. There was no programming, there was no integration, no consultants required, there was nothing. Let's, uh, let's make up a company name so we don't offend anyone. Uh, let's call it ABC Company. So I'll go into the deal log workspace and I'll create what we call a new target. Uh, all of my colleagues who are involved in the workspace across these different functions will jump into Podio and start to look at the tasks that they are responsible for so that we can successfully evaluate ABC Company and hopefully eventually uh, consummate the transaction and acquire ABC Company and then integrate the ABC Company uh, so that 
the employees uh, of ABC Company that are successfully brought into Twitter and they have a good experience once they join our company. One of the nice things about Podio is that, in the same way that I enjoy Twitter, because I can scan Twitter for tweets and get updated on all the information that's valuable to me, Podio has a similar kind of mindset, I think, in how they design a product. I can scan this news feed view, and I can see all the actions that are happening across the organization related to a deal that I'm driving. I would say that we've vastly improved our ability to orchestrate and to work together as a team because we have a common workspace uh, inside of Podio so that everyone can track uh, what they're responsible for and that they can share information with uh, their dependencies or their dependents in other parts of the company. Cool. Um, I guess it's, it doesn't get any better than guy from Twitter compares your product to Twitter. <laughs> then, uh, yeah, <laughs> love that quote. He makes, there's a couple of, uh, just a couple of comments on when, when you, what's so fascinating for me as, as, as a lawyer to be in this space of, of, of technology companies is that everything, everything is possible. You know, everything is greenfield. There's no limitation because we're not working with, with physical products, not in the, in the line of business I've chosen. So, and, and that is so fascinating, but also as, as the, 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 the kind of the, the, the barriers of entry in terms of how advanced stuff you could do with how much effort, with quite little effort, then it becomes the kind of the, the winners in the future are the ones that can make it simple. Where it's kind of, you know, it can do a lot of things. It, it's quite complex in terms of what it can achieve for you as a user, but the way the end user approaches it is that it feels simple. I'm not claiming that we have done it a you know, I think we've done a good job, close to be great, but still that's a lot of the things we're working on. So this guy you saw there, he thought it was so compelling that he didn't have to work with consultants and he could do it himself in five or 10 minutes. And then you look at what he did and then you said, then you think, or we might think here, would you ever work with a consultant for 10 weeks to do just that? And yes, that's the world a lot of people are coming from is that just the simple thing about containing information in the workplace becomes extremely complex because of compliance, because of security, because of who needs to be involved in designing the product and all of that. And, and it needs to be scalable, it needs to do this in the future and all of that. Then even the smaller thing of a deal flow like this becomes super, super complicated. So just, just a remark. I'll stop now. I didn't manage to keep it at 10 minutes, spent 30 minutes, but I'll shut up now and then let you ask questions and then ask, answer them short. There was one up there. So, why do you feel you're losing security? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's I think that's the key here is that they convince you that it's more sure because it, it's more secure because it sits on your own server. But we invest, you know, I would assume, and I, you know, that our the guys with us looking at security, we're hosting this in Amazon with Amazon Web Services, right? So they have an army of folks looking at security, both the physical security in terms of, you know, people cannot enter that building where our servers are. It's virtual, so you don't even know what our service is. But, but then, then, the, 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 then for, for us as, as a company as well, the, the, you know, the way we treat security is because we are, you know, will be dead in the water as a company if we breach any security in terms of uh, sharing data, in terms of leaking data, in terms of not maintaining the data. Whereas if someone did that with your local installation of SharePoint, what happened? You know, he, didn't get, he doesn't get his next race or get a smaller Christmas present, right? This is Denmark, so we don't even have consequences when you do, do failures like that. So, so, so you know, his incentive to, to really maintain that security is lower than my incentive. It's pretty simple like that. So I, I would claim that it's much more secure to put it with us than on your local uh, SharePoint installation. 
But it is, but but it's, it, it, it's a relevant point because it is a point because the uh, the the old guard that has been out there in you know selling on-premise solution, they 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 are saying this day in and day out. But I I would still claim that these most SaaS solutions are more secure than on-premise solutions. Uh, I'll just jump for another. Yeah. Uh, to provide any uh, education or any advice for users. It's a very, very good point, and we are probably on a jun uh, at a junction now, a junction now where we where we will start doing that. We are we are discussing some ideas around a Podi University where we can actually train some trainers that can go out there in workplaces and, and, and help people. Because even though we put something out that we we think is super simple and you can just start using it, then if we don't uh, take it serious around the the, the training. Then we, we actually uh, we, we actually forget that technology is only a part of, of the solution because you have people and process as well and those are the other uh, you know two parts of, of when you look at, at things that get adopted in the workplace and no matter how simple or how easy it gets to get start using inside Podio you would still need that super user that go out to other people in the workplace and say this is how we should use Podio so agree on some process around it and then get people some simple ideas on what can you do in there. We try to do it, but we would probably have over time some people out there, maybe a, f a year from now, a thousand people that have been through the Podi University, and then they, they can then go out to the wor workplaces and sell their hours, or you know, 200 Danish or 500 Danish or 1500 Danish an hour to do that workshop, three-hour workshop. We don't want to do it because it's not really scalable. We believe we're good at building technology, but we definitely need to know that we need to understand the people in the process part as well, and then facilitate that someone else can do that on our behalf or on their own behalf, but, but for the users. Uh, sorry, there was one over here. Yeah. Why have you chosen to have a, to have a, to resend an email with, as a default? So every time everybody writes something in Podio, then you get an email. Hey, everybody write. Why is that a default? On it's, it, it's on default because a lot of people start an email. They come from email today, right? So we want to slowly get them over in Podio. So we want them to be so annoyed with getting all these emails because the comments makes, uh, their colleagues make status updates. So one day they'll go in and turn off those notifications and then they know the only way to obtain that information is then to log into Podio and then we have got, got them hooked. Same strategy applied by, by Facebook early days. Facebook was big on email notifications because people came from email and then you, you then stopped getting those notifications and logged into Facebook uh, first thing in the morning instead of logging into emails first thing in the morning. And slowly people, we, we now have uh, you know, thousands of thousands, I cannot say the exact number, but it's quite amazing how many people we have that are using Podio on a daily basis. So where they log into Podio every day and stay there for many hours. How did you get this? How did you hear about the company? How did you hear about the startup? I'm thinking more on to the way I want you to answer on this one is how did the guys that started up Podio get a hold of someone like you to invest in the company and come with know-how? Um, they they approach so so they knew through uh, Morten Lund. Who, who's, who's a good friend of mine, uh, he knew there uh, a guy that had invested uh, a, you know, fifty, seventy thousand dollars in the company very, very early days, uh, so early seed investment. Yeah. He, he, he knew him. They had been talking and they knew that I was about to, to leave Vodafone. Yeah. So in, in March that year where my contract with Vodafone ran out uh, in, in, in May, they, uh, they approached me and said, you should have a look at that. And I was actually on, uh, I was uh, about to get my, my second child uh, in, in August later that year. And I've been, you know, you, you saw my, my history up there. So I basically never, never took any time off. And now I had a bit of money in the bank and two kids. So, you know, now it's time to relax. And then I, uh, I start talking to those guys and I start saying, I'll not get involved, I might invest but not even sure about that. And then we started having the discussion and I just got so inspired by, by this because I'd felt the pain myself in both other startups and McKinsey and in Vodafone about work being broken, so I want to be part of that. And then, you know, I couldn't help it. I, I'm really um, bad at, at delegating stuff, so I couldn't, you know, I, I didn't trust them to build it. <laughs> Uh, no, not true. So I want, but I wanted to be involved. I love building companies, and I couldn't see myself. Then at, at the end of the day, I couldn't see myself. The timing could have been better. It could have been a year later that I met them, because then I could have taken the time, a bit of time off. But but the um, they basically so through networking, they got in contact with me, and I got inspired by what they had built already. And then we had a we had a good match in terms of that we can get the ends to meet in terms of me being CEO and investor, and them giving up a uh, power and uh, shares. 
contact with you to, to your friend Morten. Was that like through, through a network of, of startup, or was it just that they knew this guy Morten that then knew you, or, or was it through one of these formal startups? No, it was very, very informal, right? You know, be out there and, and be active. So it's not through an, any accelerator or anything like that. It's just to, to be active out there, right? Uh, common. Most of these guys and you know people in the startup world are so approachable. You know, right? Right? I hope no one wrote me an email and didn't get any answer. But uh, I would claim that you know, don't shoot me an email. Shoot me a message. Shoot me a message on Podio or on Twitter or on Facebook or an email, and I'll get back to you. And I might direct you. And I might not have time, but I can definitely you know spend five minutes on direct you know p pointing you in the right direction. So so and that's that's all over in the startup world. I okay. guess other people can confirm that today. So so that I don't. But just do it, right? There's a lot of these things around startup is execution, right? The brilliant uh, quote from the uh, the social network, the movie is that. If if you have in, if you invented Facebook, you had built it, right? Or you have done Facebook, right? And that's you know a lot of people can claim I could have done that, yeah, but you didn't do it, right? And that's the same thing also with networking. It comes down to execution. I cannot keep track on. There's one there. Um, how do you make money? Uh, Podio cost eight dollar per per user per month, and we have a pretty solid uh, conversion rate of of the use that can uh, upgrade to uh, to a paid account. The, you can start using uh, Podio, the service for free, so we run what we call a freemium service. So Podio is almost all features unlocked from, from, from day one, uh, and you can use it for up to five people for free forever. But if you're more than five people, and most companies or teams are more than five people, you have to upgrade to a paid account, and that costs $8 per user per month. But you can get it for free because we sponsor universities. Yeah! <laughs> No, I think uh, I'll just see if there were anyone else that didn't have any. Okay, yeah. I work for one of these uh, old-fashioned drug companies, and I think our IT policy is uh, from the beginning of the world. It's as, at least as old as the company. Oh, as the CIO, right? <laughs> That's probably yeah. twice the age. <laughs> okay. And uh, I'm I'm trying to use SharePoint, but that's. But I I I actually like it, prefer the email over the SharePoint because it's so. Difficult using. Um, can you give me uh, what, what should I tell my, my boss and, and the one who's responsible for IT for, 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 for using Podio? How can I convince them? Because they are, as, as one of my fellow students said, like, a lot of the companies they own trust the Microsoft, and I'm working on one of those. They, they like Microsoft and everything on their own service, they don't like anything in the cloud. How can I convince them to do so, so the most successful case we have seen in terms of convincing is that people have started for free or swipe their own credit card, start to use the service. And this is the amazing part about these new kind of services. And they start using them. And then they go to the people in charge of this and they show them what they have been able to do in terms of how they have uh, done this, this, this or that project on Podio. And when they show that to people, people have in most cases been extremely impressed with that. When they tell them it costs uh, $8 per user per month and we can cancel at any time. No kind of, you know, no long-term commitment and everything is accessible through an API. So we can, or, you know, get things out uh, with XML. So you can actually easily churn away if you have, uh, you know, put a lot of content into Podio and then one day you want to have that locally or you want to go to another service. You can also do that. When they tell, you know, show people what they have done there, tell them what the cost is and what, how low the commitment is. And then also show, uh, tell them that they can, we can easily get out of this in terms of the information. Then you know most cases have actually been been able to convince people to roll out across the company. So, it's, but it always starts with that one person believing believing in the product because I don't have that sales force that go out and convince them. SharePoint is uh, is shit. Uh, we, 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 we're the stuff. So, and and SharePoint have those sales guys going out and, and, and say that of the partnership, right? So, so we're competing with that, but we're competing with a much better product. So, what we believe in, and, and that's a lot for for these. Uh, uh, SaaS companies or you know software as a service to, to the businesses that this is the new way of selling things is there's no commitment it's upfront you only pay for what you use and that is the new movement and luckily CIO start seeing that as well is that they can reduce the cost one of the best example is um, Google Apps pretty much the same price point right 
uh, some big installations in Denmark. I know Odense Kommune have been trying to use it, uh, couldn't get uh, it approved because the Danish uh, you know, uh, Data Protection Act is, is pretty rigid on this point still, so wouldn't allow them to put sensitive information, so people uh, information about people's um, uh, sickness, race, or or what have you. So so they were not allowed to do that. But Berlinske uh, is another example. They took took the entire company. I think there are a couple of thousand people there. Took it to into the cloud. Took it to Google Apps. So it is happening now. So you know we're the future. You know, uh, SharePoint and, and the likes is the past, and we will uh, conquer them eventually. But uh, we'll take, take a, a bit of fight, and then we'll take people like you that start using it. And that's so we're Trojan, we use the Trojan horse, uh, you know, uh, way into the companies, right? With people like you, mostly young people, get interested in this, and then they start using it and spread it around inside the company. A long answer. Sorry, you had a follow up question, I believe. Yeah, no, just. <laughs> I work in IT and sourcing in the company and we had a lot of problems as you just checked out that you connected your email accounts to your uh, to your folio. Can you connect with both your personal account and your work account to the same? So you get get this you get both your your professional email and your personal email into folio. Because we had a problem that the passwords the passwords of the users were too easy to guess, so that's why there's a problem putting it out on the internet, letting people, if they can guess the password, then they can put it into the folio. And then, and then further on to email, or, yeah. Yeah, they can gather information, like, yeah, company espionage, whatever, that would be a problem. But, so what, we had encryption, and it's like, they too was okay against the system, and it was cracked, but, it was all in the name of security, and you only had to you know, connect your personal email and your work email and your email inside. So we are, we are not exposing information from any uh, email. So the only email you can connect is, is actually Google, uh, so Google Apps. Uh, you can only do it when you're in Google Apps, not if you just have a private Gmail account so far. So, and, and you cannot use Podio to obtain information from your email account. You can only use it to integrate it. So when you're logged into your email account, you can then put tasks into Podio. Uh, and things like that. So we don't have that issue of yet us being the weak point and then gaining access to much, uh, you know, higher uh, security grade systems. We don't have that issue yet. Uh, we might have it in the future because we will be integrating more and more systems. Back to, to, to your answer here, uh, to your question around why do we have notifications on email? That is because we don't, we're not an island, even though we know this is, you know, the best way of doing things. We know that we have to coexist with other existing tools, so we are doing integrations with the SAP in the future. We'll be doing integration with other SaaS services like we've done with Google, and we would definitely don't want to be the weak point in that. So so far, it's pretty pretty you know Chinese walls between the systems. So it's more like you can put things from these other systems into Podio, but Podio cannot obtain the things from these other systems, and we're not you know we just had a security review and we actually came and scored pretty high on that. So I'm pretty confident. But, but relevant question, and these are the questions we're getting out uh, when we roll this out. A quick one. Uh, just a point on your uh, integration strategy in terms of how to get into a company addressing that. Just thinking perhaps you could do it on a project basis. So rather than convincing a company to roll out Podio completely, you can say, let's try it out on one project. Typically when we work with industry from academia, we will say try out our tools and methods on one project, then it gets it into the company. You have a few champions then and slowly you can roll out. Yeah. Um, I had one quick question for you before we uh, close the break, uh, which was, it seems like you have to do a lot of upwork, uh, well, a, lo a lot of upfront work before you can make this, this type of product of any use or get any revenue from it. Just wondering what your kind of payoff time was or, uh, or is due to be. <laughs> Good question. Never thought, of, never thought of it like that, okay. seriously. Um, there's some investors that put money in, they put money in for equity, so it's not money that should be paid back. Yeah. And, and with those investors, we, uh, you know, we, we, we then have some discussion with them on, on you know, when do we want to break even, right? Almost like that, because we could focus more on bigger companies um, and, and get you know, a few thousand people installations out there within the next quarter. Uh, you know, bend a few, uh, uh, of, uh, bend a few of our own kind of principles around the design. Maybe a bit of LDAP integration, allow some users to control other users. Not what we believe in, 
and all of that. And then we could, you know, probably sell 10,000 10, uh, 10, people installations within the next uh, quarter. That would, uh, would give you uh, 10,000 users, $8 a month at $80,000 US dollar. That's a pretty solid part of my, of my cost base and I have quite revenue. Uh, quite a lot of revenue so far. So with that simple effort, I might become break even, uh, you know, before the end of uh, second quarter. But we're not doing that because we want to build this platform for the future, for a lot of users, and become a real competitor and a real threat to Salesforce and, and Microsoft. So we're not making those because we believe those to be short-term optimization. But we can do it, and that's the actually and just an, an advice for you if you're looking at what what your idea is. Don't get drawn into all these social location picture filter thing because there's a ton of them out there and there's no money in it and only a very, very few of them get acquired by, by, by Twitter or Google or Facebook. If you go and do stuff like this that adds value out in the workplace, if you do something for people, you know, for businesses, they're prepared to pay for it because if you can prove them that you're doing something smarter, better, or they save money or earn more money, then they'll pay for it. They might pay $10 a month per user, they might be $100 or $100,000 per installation or whatever your business model is. And then you have something to fall back on. You can still go for the, for, for the, for the pot of gold because you go and build a platform. We want to list on NASDAQ one day, but day to day you have a solid business underneath. And that is quite some in, if, when you build your business that you have that solid business. That's what I have in Podio. I didn't have that in, 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 in soup back then. Barely no revenue and you know, perfect timing that we got acquired by, uh, by Vodafone, to be honest. So, uh, so just, you know, I don't know whether it, it answers, but yes, you need to invest up front. That's also why if you want, you know, when, when you go and do your business, at the outset, decide what kind of business you want to build. Is it a business for you and your four bodies to, to make a living and, and a bit of money? Then there's one to five chance that this, you will achieve that. If it's something that you know you want 20 people and you want to actually be able to take uh, one million Danish out a year in 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 uh, Udbyte, uh, in distribution from the company, then there's probably one in 20 chance. And then you go up there. If you want to build the next Facebook, there's a one in a million or one in a billion chance you'll do that. But still go for it. But just make that clear from day one what you want to do. And if it is one of those that you want to go for for a big thing or want to build a podium or, or whatever you, 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 you want, then, then you need to be clear on that. That Then I believe the path forward is to start up with something, have, have, have a solid prototype, have some users already and try to find those money from, from, from guys like me or from your uh, friends and family and then go out and raise four million, six million dollars so you can then build the, build the real product and build the real team behind it and then go for the gold instead of believing that you can go bootstrapping all the way. My, that, that's at least my, my, uh, my experience. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we're gonna have to uh, uh, cool. call it for a break now, but uh, I think we can tell one of the reasons Podio is a success is because it's got a very enthusiastic, energetic uh, CEO. Uh, we'd like to thank you once again for uh, joining us today. Thank Thanks. you. Good luck. Uh, so we'll take a break for uh, nine minutes and be back by quarter past, please. Thanks. <coughs>